Welcome everybody to another in the series of lunchtime lectures that the GSSA is putting on. Um, we have had a number of speakers in the past week and have a number set up uh, for the coming week, all at one o'clock in the afternoon. My name is Craig Smith. I'm the executive manager, manager of the GSSA and I'll give you, I'll turn on my video so you can have a look at me. Um, just a few housekeeping rules before we start. Please can everybody um, mute themselves and also uh, stop their video. Uh, we, it'll, it'll save bandwidth in these times of high bandwidth usage. Um, we've got at the moment 23 participants and I'll let people into the waiting room from the waiting room as they come in. Uh, there's a raise hand function, which we'll be playing with um, throughout the meeting. I think Roy will control that. Uh, if by some chance we get Zoom bombed, which we haven't had yet, have had to happen to us yet, I'll probably just close the meeting and restart it. So bear with us, but it hasn't been a problem to date. This is a secure meeting. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Roy Irving. Uh, who's going to give us our talk today entitled How to Optimize the Geological Data Collection Process. Uh, to give you a bit of back background about Roy, he's a member of the GSSA. He graduated with an honors degree in 1978 in geology from Dundee University in Scotland. He completed an MSc at University College London in 1979 in, of all things, micropaleontology. Uh, he, he was fully intent on having a career in the oil and gas industry, but things did not go according to plan, so he, uh, the, he ended up at Anglo-American in London, who found him a job as a geologist in South Africa. He joined De Beers in 1979, and he remained with De Beers until 2007. Roy and I were colleagues in those days, um, he had a wonderful career covering all aspects of the mining process. And Roy also has an MDP diploma from uh, UNISA, which he got in 1991. He spent, since his De Beers days, he spent seven years with Datamine, uh, focusing on the exploration side of software and assisting companies to optimize the data collection process, which is what he's going to talk about today, I believe. From 2014, he worked in Mauritania for three years as a database and uh, QA, QC manager for Kinross Gold. He started his own company, Ivy Tech Trading in 2018, worked with various companies such as Deca Dynamics, Snowden, Mining Consultants, and Data Mine on training, due diligence, and most recently, the development of e-learning material. He is registered with SACNASP uh, from 1987. And he says he enjoys sharing his knowledge. It allows him to create some space in the brain to fill up with other new knowledge. Just what we need in these, in these days and times. So Roy, I'll hand over to you with that and carry on. All right, um, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Uh, I think let's try raising your hands. Okay. Let's... Okay, lots of hand raising. So if you just click the raise hand button again, then your hand will go down again. All right, um, good afternoon. So thanks very much for spending your Easter Monday with me and to the GSSA for the opportunity to present. Um, as the title says, I'm going to be talking about the geological data collection process, which is what I've spent most of my career working on and some little tricks and tips on how to optimize that. So I always like to start a presentation by giving you an overview of what we're going to cover. So first of all, we'll unpack the title, which basically means breaking down each individual term and talking a little bit about it. So We'll do optimize, we'll do data, we'll do geological data, which a lot of people have already talked about. Then we'll look at the collection process and then a wonderful management acronym called MBWA. 
and then I'll have some concluding remarks and then there'll be some time for questions and answers. So first of all, we let's look at unpacking the topic. So if we look at the definition, a dictionary definition of what is optimized, this is a good one for Merriam-Webster, which is one of the good online dictionaries. It says to make things as perfect, effective, or functional as possible. And one of the things about exploration and mining, it's extremely difficult to make it perfect. So let's not worry about that. But what we want to try and do is make it as effective and as functional as possible. So you can ask that question, how well do you think your geological data collection process is operating? And I think if you really, anyone who's been involved with this, if you really think about it, it's a question we tend not to ask very often. So that's where we can start to look at how other industries where being optimized is really important. And Hopefully most of you have heard of Peter Drucker. He was basically the man who invented modern business management. And he said, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And I think this is one of the biggest problems with geological data collection is that we don't really measure how well we're doing it, but yet we do try to improve it or we want to improve it. Okay, if you move on to data, again, from the same source, you know, what is data? So here we are, a simple definition. It's factual information, such as measurement or statistics, used as a basis for reasoning, discussion, or calculation. And throughout the talk, I'll be talking about the data R. And a lot of people are saying, well, why do you use the plural? And it's really because data is the plural of datum. And unfortunately, there's two schools of thought. It's either plural or it's not. It doesn't really matter, but the important thing is to try and be consistent. I, I expand data for geological purposes into more than just things that you can manipulate on a spreadsheet, like we've got in the left-hand picture. Something like this middle picture, a laboratory certificate. It is information, but it's got a lot of data in it. And certainly for my three years in Mauritania, I realized the great value of this thing. And I get horrified when I go on a mining site and say, well, where's your mining, uh, where's your laboratory certificates? and they haven't even downloaded them from the email yet. People don't realize how much good data is sitting in there. And then you know, another type of data is the core box. You can pull out lots of little data elements from that. So again, it's very important to keep track of these things because that's going to assist you in your reasoning, in your discussion, and in some cases in your calculations. It isn't just about the numbers. So as I mentioned, some of the other speakers have talked a lot about the different types of geological data. So here's just a summary of that. On the left-hand side, on the top, we've got a drill chip core box where obviously, you know, some of the data is the whole number, the depth the sample came from, and then obviously a description of what the chips tell you. Then you have geotechnical data where you're looking at the physical properties. So there's an example of how you would measure how hard the rock is, how strong the rock is, sorry. And then the topic that was very popular when Craig and I were still at De Beers was looking at the geometallurgical. It's all very well knowing what's in the rock, but the important bit is how do you assist the plant designers to maximize the extraction of the valuable material? And then in the bottom row, I think most people will 
recognize Bill McKechnie. Um, he was one of my first bosses at De Beers and I'm, I'm working with him again at Snowden. And one of the things I remember him telling me is that sample positioning is one of the most critical things, but it's one of the things that people tend to forget about. And he summed it up very nicely to say that a sample without a coordinate is just a bag of sand. Roy, we've lost you. <clears throat> we seem to have lost connection. Give us a couple of minutes to see if it comes back. Let's see what happens. Uh, Roy is obviously checked out of the meeting, probably because of bandwidth issues. Issues. Give us a couple of minutes to try and bring him back. Okay, okay. Right. carry on where you were, where you left but off. That's I perfect. Guess. Okay, so just to sum up on this slide, the basis for doing all of the data collection is to be able to produce geological models like the one that is shown here, and most importantly, to make sure that that model can stand up to both internal and external scrutiny. Okay, moving on to the geological data collection process. As Craig mentioned, I spent most of my career with De Beers doing diamond discoveries, so um, I'm slightly biased in the slides I use. So on the top left, we've got the original discoverers of Arapa, and you know that world-class mine was discovered by this very simple technique in the top middle, soil sampling where you basically walked 14 kilometer traverses every day. And by the end of the traverse, you were carrying about 20 kilograms of sample. So James's comment about geologists having to be fit was certainly needed in those days. And then your data review was very much like this. You would just be sitting on the ground looking at what you're getting and then deciding what does this new sample result tell you? De Beers, um, I'm not sure um, how many people outside De Beers knew this, but they were the first company to actually use an airship. They rented this blimp from Zeppelin in Germany, equipped it with a gravity um, detection system, and flew it around Botswana for a couple of years. Here's a picture of it moored as running mine. And now, obviously, in the last five or 10 years, there's a lot more tools for the geologists. Things like Google Earth allow us to very quickly look at any area in the world and to superimpose GIS data that's either public domain or purchased data. And then the big 
new technique in, over the last couple of years is using drones for both um, reconnaissance type work. For do, the mines are using a lot of this for doing their surveys and they've even got them working underground now. Carrying on with the data collection things, in terms of base metals and precious metals, one of the big game changers is using these types of portable XRF units, which allow you to get a reading about the metal content or the metal element content in a sample within a few minutes compared to the old days of where you would have to prepare the sample, ship it to a laboratory, wait a few weeks, and then you get the result back. Um, they're still not obviously as good as the main laboratories, but the nice thing with this kind of technique, it allows you to prioritize what samples you need to send to the lab. And then by having all of this data, you now want to start bringing it together. So ALS is one of the big lab companies have got this tool called Core Viewer that allows you to have, first of all, a normal RGB picture of your core. Then you can have hyperspectral in very different wavelengths. You can then graph that and you can then look at your different mineral elements and start to identify where the area of interest is. James also mentioned about artificial intelligence. And I know some people seem to think this is something that might be making us redundant. I don't think it is. I think it's just another great tool that we can use to assist us to manage this vast amount of data we're collecting. And if you click on this link, you've got a hundred slides that you can look through from a conference a couple of years ago. And the interesting thing is this came from IBM. And why it's of interest to me is that this delightful unit on the right hand side, the IBM XT, that was how I got into computing with De Beers. Um, with this, we were able to plot our samples without having to have a human draftsman, which was to me one of the game changers in the way we worked. Going back to optimize now. It's one of the things that I've been very interested in since my days at De Beers is to look at how other companies actually optimize their processes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're producing, you know, like one of the things at the moment is all of the PPE for the COVID work, you want to make sure if you're wearing a mask, it is really going to help you. And so people like 3M, who were one of the main manufacturers on this, they were producing millions of them. So they must make sure that each one works. Otherwise, their reputation goes down the tubes. So one of the things they did is just ask these simple six questions. What, what is the task that you're doing? What are the inputs and what are the outputs? Why is this task important? If it isn't important, then let's stop doing it. Who's involved? We quite often see the thing about people process technology but then we don't really spend a lot of time to understand who the people are, how they interact. Then moving on to how, how do we do this process? When and is it being performed the same way in different operations? And if you go to major mining companies and you go to different sites, they're generally doing the same things, but people tend to do them differently and yet they expect to get the same output all the time. And then lastly, when does the task happen? And more importantly, how long should it take you? So if you ask most geologists and most technicians to try and break their work down into these questions, they'll 
end up looking as puzzled as this young lady, that uh, Canadian geologist, I find a picture on the internet. And so one of the ways that you can clarify this is to look at some of the pioneers of this. So get up on the right hand side, John Zuckman. He used to work for IBM. And in the 60s, he asked the same question. If we're gonna build a better computer system, it's a system, let me find out how do other things work? So he ended up going to Boeing and he went to the railways to understand how those companies work. And basically he codified those six questions into different models and companies who use this have got a much clearer understanding of what their process are than unfortunately most mining companies who haven't even scratched the surface. So this little flow diagram here, most geologists should be able to give you something that looks like that. So if you're doing drilling, you'll start off by positioning the rig. You'll do your geological logging, you do your geotech logging, extract the samples, do your sample QAQC, which basically puts in standards and blanks, and then you'll send your sample off to a lab. The one thing they're not as good as doing is then telling you who's the person who's in charge of this. So the surveyor should be the person who's doing the positioning for you and giving you data that you can put in a database. The geologist in a big company, normally geologists will do the main logging and then you'll have people who are specialized in geotech who will do geotech logging. Sample extraction should be the geologist because they should know where they want the sample taken. But the actual process of sampling, you can give that to a technician to do. And then from that, you can then start to say, right, how many items of work should somebody be able to do each day? So here's an example of where each task has got a measure and it's a different measure. So you know, before everybody says, I can do more or I can do less of this, these are just examples to show you that you've got, you're measuring holes in one point, then you're measuring core distance, then you're measuring physical samples. And the last two, you group the samples into batches and you're measuring those. So I've always been puzzled, why aren't we, more consistent in the way we work. And when I was at De Beers, obvious, oh, sorry, at Databine, this was one of the things I spent a lot of time with the people using the software. And to me, as a technical challenge, it wasn't difficult to make sure that we had all of the coordinates. We had the drill data to the end of the hole. We didn't have overlapping samples. But for some reason, many of the mines just couldn't get this right. So what I did one day, I sat down with one of the underground geologists and I said to him, please tell me exactly what you do. And we just did it by writing down each task on a sticky. And then he lined them up, he put in some times. And it was astonishing that he worked an 11 hour day doing underground mapping. And the thing that he was, there to do, which was the mapping. He spent one hour a day doing it. He traveled for eight hours because it was one of these very deep mines where he was walking everywhere. And then he sat in meetings for two hours. So what we ended up doing was looking at a matrix like this and breaking those things down and saying, what you should be doing is more of the high value work what you shouldn't be doing is things that have got no value. And quite often that was a lot of meetings he attended that really he didn't add any value to it at all. And the other ones we should be doing is to try and do the things that are high value and don't take up very much time. He took this information back to his boss and instead of going underground every day, he went underground two days a week and then he suddenly freed up three days to do more of the high value things. 
So a lot of this stuff that I've learned over my 40 years has been because De Beers had an amazing internal mentoring system. And I've sort of expanded on that by looking at other industries. So what I wanted to do to try and use the hands up thing, um, how many people know what MBWA is? So if you can try putting your hands up and let's see what happens. We hope you don't break it. Um, Craig, I can't actually see the other participants. Can you just see how many people's hands are up? Okay, no one at the moment. Nobody, okay, that's good. All right, so don't worry then. All right, so basically what MBWA means is management by walking about. Um, the Americans like to change terms, so they call it management by wandering around, keeping your finger on the pulse. And basically what it means is instead of you emailing your team all the time or sending them WhatsApp, just get up from your office or your desk and go and have a little talk to the people and what, observe what they're doing and talk in general. Um, Dilbert obviously has got some great takes on this that is his boss saying, my new style of management is exhausting me. You know, he tried to do management by walking around. So he just walked to the park and back, but he didn't see any improvement because he only got part of it. It isn't just a case of going and observing, it's going and talking and very importantly, listening because everybody can make their work better but quite often we don't give them enough time to we don't listen to them enough the other one is knowledge management um, and something called the after action review and basically this developed from the u.s army where they would go out on a mission this is actually a picture from some mission in afghanistan before they go on the mission, they've got some in intelligence about what they're going to see. And if all goes to plan, everybody comes back without being injured. But unfortunately, as we've all seen in war, it isn't like that. So if something unexpected happened, they would get together at the end of the mission and just ask these simple questions. What was supposed to happen? What did happen? What went well? So let's keep doing that. And what can we improve and what can we learn from that? And the beauty of this technique is that literally it takes less than 10 minutes. So it's a case of instead of everybody rushing home at the end of your day, just spend 10 minutes with your team at least once a week. And it's, I think you'll see big changes. As I say, it gives a chance for your team to give you feedback. So in terms of the concluding remarks, first of all, a lot of minds have got very good processes, but they're sitting in the manager's offices. I was at a mine up in Ghana a few months ago, and I spent most of my time in the courtyard, and I didn't see the process in the courtyard. I saw it in the manager's office. So by the end of the week, the process was now in the courtyard. Standard operating procedures is the standard way that people have been working. So yes, they're very important, but the important thing is don't make them 40 pages long, make them concise, and most importantly, keep them up to date. Change happens quite often from the top. So if you're really keen about this, tell your team that one of the KPIs that everybody's got is we want to improve the process. And there's no such thing as a bad idea. If you've got an idea, let's discuss it. And as a manager, certainly this is one of the issues that managers have a problem with, is that they seem to spend half their day sitting in meetings. Are they really value add those meetings? Look at what you're doing and try and change it so that you can deliver things. And because 
you know, here's the pictures of me back in the 1980s. And I ran a camp of 100 people. We sampled 5,000 square kilometers. And the tent was everything. The tent was where obviously where I slept. It's where I sat and planned the day. There was no technology. We had a radio. But we managed to achieve the work. So those old management techniques have still got great relevance. So there's lots of time now to do research, look at what other industries are doing, and then try some of those things out. OK, thank you very much. Um, apologies for the technical issues, but we've got through it all. So if anybody's got any questions. Thank you, Roy. Um, for the question and discussion um, uh, section here, you need to raise your hand and then unmute yourself, uh, unmute your microphone and fire away. Hi, Roy. Hi there. Um, who's got the hand up? Where? Uh, you're speaking to Chris. Hi, Chris. Yes, thanks for the lovely talk. Uh, <clears throat> I just have two comments. Um, I've seen one of the issues when it comes to geos in the mines, um, more especially on the data collection, is that the responsibilities of the geo, they range from exploration all the way to underground. And in one of the things I've seen, I'm a, I'm a chief geologist now in one of the um, major mining companies. One thing I've seen is most of the geos management wants them to spend more time doing underground work uh, because that's where the action is. And when it comes to the issues of data collection, uh, there's little time spent there. And that's where really the heart of the mine is because when they spend little time doing the data collection, uh, more especially logging and sampling, that's where a lot of mistakes come in. So when the data comes to me, on the resource site and I have to create models. More often I find that I have to go back to the core and correct a simple uh, sample interval mistake that was overlooked because of the pressure. So because of the costs, you know, uh, of running a mine, it's not really possible to have one geo dedicated to data collection, but rather the geos are being overstretched to go do exploration underground, come back and attend meetings. So that matrix, I think, yeah, I'll sit with my team and try and, and, and work it out and see what, what high value activities we can focus on. But that was my comment for now. Thanks. No, that's, that's really excellent, Chris. That's so good that it's sort of backed up what I've seen. So if you want to um, talk to me more about it offline, just drop me an email there. Um, because that's exactly the issue, is that the managers don't realize the value of what the geologists are doing and they also don't realize how much time they're wasting and unless you sit and do that kind of analysis it won't change so you almost need to say I, I'm going to have a workshop to understand exactly what everybody does and then suddenly that's where the change can start to happen. Any other questions? No other discussion or comment or questions? Uh, Craig, Chris, again, maybe just a 30 second comment. Another thing that I've, I've seen, uh, Roy, uh, mm -hmm. is that most of the data collection, for example, logging and sampling, is usually given to graduates or new graduates or students mm -hmm. who are doing vocational work. And in most of the cases, there is not really great oversight in really checking um, what they have logged, if the log, lo logging is according to SOP. Um, because obviously with the geos being busy, uh, logging becomes something of a nuisance to say, let the graduates or the new students do it. And then later on, two months down the line, when we have to use the data, you find uh, major discrepancies even there. So my, my take on the issue is I think uh, new graduates or students should be working under uh, supervision and there should be great oversight in what they do so that you avoid uh, 
uh, having data in your model that doesn't make sense at the end of the day. Thanks. Yeah, no, again, that's a perfect um, observation and that's where the technology can assist you in that I know it's very difficult to keep doing a peer review of logging if you have to use the physical log, but that's where the advantage of having good core photography comes in is that you know we would actually be able to sit and do a peer review of a core box if we had a good digital image. So again, that's something that you need to raise it as an issue and then say there are solutions out there, can we please investigate them? And there are, I was actually trying to find that I saw a paper a couple of years ago where um, the AI people had done a test, I think it was in Australia, of a group of geologists logging a hole and getting the computer to log the hole. And of course, the computer was a lot more consistent, whether it was right or not. It was that consistency was the important bit. So, you know, really look at where AI comes in because everybody is under pressure. The days of having 20 geologists on the mine, unfortunately, have gone. So we have to work in a different way to the way we used to work. Could I just make a comment as well about core logging? Um, in my career, I've seen it um, one of the most important functions that we as geologists can possibly do. It's the first step in, in resource evaluation. And it's done oftentimes in a very sloppy manner. Mm -hmm. It's critical stuff. Um, it's perhaps some of the most critical things that we do. Uh, but in addition to that, I'd like to see uh, more cooperation with the academic institutions and, and doing things like petrology of your rocks. Um, I can assure you that, a, that a, an investment banker has no idea what mineralogy is. And in an ore deposit, the mineralogy can determine the, the geometallurgy characteristics and the way in which you uh, handle, the, handle the production process. Yet there's, there's hundreds of kilometers of core drilled every year in certain parts of the world that get a cursory hand lens examination and no petrology is done at all. So I think that's a hole in, in some of what we do. Just a comment. Yeah, no, it's excellent. I think that's a bit, if we look back at the golden years of exploration in South Africa, the number of resources that worked and the experience that there was, you know, De Beers had thousands of man years. And now, as you said, the people are just saying, I need to do this to get it out of the way. That's completely the wrong attitude. Any other questions? I think Zama had a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, Zachariah. Hi, Zach. Wait a minute, let me unmute him. Huh. Uh, ladies first, uh, let Zama go for it, and then Zach. Zama, okay, Zach then. I think there's some microphone trouble with those with those two computers. Can you uh, unmute? Um, I've unmuted Zach, uh, Zama. Zach and Zachariah as well. Yeah, I see Zachariah is still muted. I can't uh, seem to get him okay. unmuted. Huh. For some reason, I can't unmute Zachariah. Uh. 
Sorry, I'm not hearing this very well at all. I'm not sure what the problem is. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. My name is Zach, and I'm a geologist um, here in Gauteng. Um, mm -hmm. Whilst we are on the question of, of logging and sampling, one thing that I've picked up is uh, one geologist will be required to do underground work, mapping on flat ends and stokes, and then you will then be required to obviously generate a report from that and communicate all your findings to the relevant mining personnel. And then in addition to that, you required to log. From the logging that you'll be doing, you probably laid out the borehole, so you now have to um, log it, you have to sample it, you have to capture everything on the system, and, and everything is just dependent on you. So my question is, how can we then, as a geologist, sort of try um, minimize the workload by perhaps trying methodologies that will be quicker and, and more reliable? Um, I, I think a good way, Zachariah, is to, if you, um, do you have any kind of process model like the ones I showed you, a flow diagram? Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have. Okay, you can, um, I think, get in touch with me afterwards. I'll give you a couple of really simple techniques to get those started. And then basically you look at what you have to do, how many people have you got to do it? Mm. And, then I de and then obviously find out what other things you have to do. And you then take all of that information back to your boss and say, look, you know, we've got an issue here. There's, let's say there's 10 persons worth of work that you're expecting us to do and there's only five of us. We believe these are the 50% most important things. If you get agreement from them, then that's what you do and you stop doing the other stuff. Because um, I know what it is like, you end up getting more and more things to do and you think, where on earth do I do? But yeah, I'll get in touch with you after this and then we can start having a discussion. Yeah, and also this whole idea of, of... Of, of managers still thinking just like, for example, they sort of assume that when you're underground, you are doing the work, but yeah. really underground is just about data collection. You just go there to collect um, data that's needed, obviously, a bit on, on the, the ore body itself or, or looking at structure and all that. The, the bulk of our work really is, is in capturing the data and making scientific projections and also putting it all together into a geological model and also uh, um, sort of expand the life of the mine. But mm -hmm. when you on surface, it's like um, you're not working and, and yeah. really most, most of our work is, is in putting all collected data together to come up with the best um, geological model, you know, so that we can advise them accordingly going forward. Yeah, no, definitely. I'll get in touch with you and then we can continue this discussion. That's, that's a very valid point, point you've made. And, and one, more, one more question. Um, um, we, we're still using the old system of logging on paper. Um, what what um, other methods are available that, that are maybe um, not as expensive and, and can sort of minimize the work? Because you, you log on paper, and then you have to take everything and put it on gauge logger. And from gauge logger, you have to go work on fusion and then and then studio, um, data mine studio. So mm -hmm. if maybe we can have, if there is a system that will maybe like something computerized. Um, there are, so that I'll talk to you about that, yeah. But again, it, it's very much, you know, the trouble is that if you try to take too many shortcuts, as Craig said, mm. yes, you, you happen to do the, rock but you actually haven't learned anything about it so yeah, yeah. sometimes you need to really sit and say what how much time do i need to spend and yeah. i say the most important thing is that's what you're paid to do yeah. and somebody else not go to the other meeting but yeah, yeah. let's we'll pick that up later on 
Okay, thank you so much. Perfect, thanks, Jack. Um, Zama's back. Sorry about okay. that. I got. Hi, Zama. Hi, I just wanted to share. Um, I work, I'm a geologist, but I work specifically with database management um, mm -hmm. on, for one of the mines. And I just wanted to speak um, after Chris's comment about how graduates and the younger students have been given the work um, and how the senior geos just don't have time to check it. I think what we're not using a lot of the time is the technological advances that are available to us. I mean, a lot of the database management systems now, you can write in constraints so that mm -hmm. you, you, by the time you're introducing your data into your system already, you're eliminating a lot of errors. And if you get everybody um, up to date and knowing how the systems work, you avoid the situation where your data waits for one specific person or there's just never time to check it at a later stage. I, um, I would agree that there's a lot of, of software that are in the market now where you can log directly into a tablet, your constraints and all your rules are already written in. So at every single step, your data is getting checked. So you don't find yourself at resource model stage. You're still going back to, to checking core. You know, you, yeah. you can spend a lot more time on your core with the logging if you eliminate some of the of the later stages, you know, where you have to transfer or physically um, be re-looking at data. Photography is great, but firsthand touching of the core and logging it thoroughly the first time around goes an absolutely long way. So maybe we should try and see with our softwares that we're using, how we can integrate them, move from the one to the other, um, and with each step have validation that's written in because, I mean, it's 2020, there's a lot we can do with systems now. Yeah, I always say that a good example is that we've got two golf carts trundling around Mars and they're producing phenomenal amounts of data that's keeping an awful lot of people learning an awful lot about that, that let's bring some of that technology back to Earth. It's out there. Um, who are you with, Zama, out of interest? Um, well, I was working for one of the platinum mines. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I did database management there for about mm -hmm. eight years with yeah. Platinum. Yes, I've, I've since moved. I'm now at one of the manganese operations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let's get in touch. Okay, thanks. Definitely, I'll drop you a mail, Roy. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another hand up from... Hi, um, it's Camille speaking. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. Camille. Yep. Um, I'm a geologist pretending to be a hydrogeologist, funny enough. Um, I've been working in the geology and hydrogeology industry for 10 years now. And essentially what my role has been is doing the hydrostratigraphic modeling for hydrogeology. So I deal a lot with data and lots of data. Um, and the biggest thing that I've noticed is that each department at mines or anybody, specifically geologists, they keep their data set. So they keep the geology data over there, the exploration data, the, the geotech data over there. And at the end of the day, all of this data is kept in different databases. They capture differently. Um, and I really think that all of the processes need to be understand, understood sorry, and brought into one database. And as Zama was saying, if the, even from the junior level, people who are capturing the data, if they're given the proper tools in order to capture the data correctly the first time, then the whole process going forward makes things much easier. So what I end up getting from clients, from the mines, is data sheets and data sheets of just Excel spreadsheets that have been captured over the years. They haven't got any, like, um, who's captured it, et cetera. Um, and I'm having to QAQC it so that it all gets into the same type of system so that I can model it. Because I'm bringing in geotech data, hydrogeological data, et cetera. So if from the get-go, instead of just, I, I, I understand as a graduate, you get to get to work and you feel overwhelmed already as it is. Now they want you to learn everything, but it's not about okay, you just log that. They need to understand the process going forward. Why am I logging it? And what detail must I go into? 
the many boreholes that I've gotten, borehole logs, they go into such detail where the ore deposit is, but then they don't do any detail further up the hole because from their perspective, they're just trying to find where the gold is. But at the end of the day, those boreholes, that borehole cost a lot of money. That time taken to drill that hole cost a lot of money. What needs to be done is detailed capture of that entire hole. So that at the end of the day, the geotech people can use it, the hydrogeologists can use it, and the geologists can use it. And I really think that mentality needs to go forward. That data, no matter what you are drilling the hole for, or what are you mapping that for, you go into as much detail as possible. Because at the end of the day, that, that information is expensive. It costs a lot of money. And now you've done a half job of it. So I really think that getting the, the from even from the juniors all the way to the managers who are dealing with juniors making sure that they understand the entire process so yeah um, i just wanted to build yeah. on what zama said there yeah if you if you drop me a mail camille i can send you that was one of the things i spent a few years on this to try and come up with this overall process model for exploration and mining and I can share that to you. And certainly when I've had success on some of the operations where the manager says, oh, is that what you actually do? And it was the first <laughs> time they'd ever seen it. And they suddenly realize when we're asking for money for a hole, yes, it's justified. We're not just wasting the company's resources. So I can definitely share all that with you. Great. Thank you, Roy. I really appreciate Thank you. that. Maybe just one more comment from me. Um, I've, over the years, I've seen um, a lot of discussion over core storage and core archiving. And um, it seems amongst, amongst the senior management teams of a lot of mining companies that, that long-term core archiving and management of that archive is a grudge purchase. Mm -hmm. Now, I think going forward, worldwide, this, this stuff is going to be very important. You're going to find mines in it. And I think we as geologists need to do a better job of trying to convince, convince non-geological senior managers and senior management teams that that archiving is essential. Uh, I, I hope everybody agrees with that. But it's, 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 uh, it's a shortfall that I, I think we have to come to grips with. Um, no, Craig, I'll, I'll support you 100% of that. And if you look at oil and gas, who are miles ahead of um, hard rock mining, you look at the core storage facilities that somebody like BP has got. It's just, wow, it's fabulous. And they use it. It isn't just stored. It's used again and again when they're trying to identify something new in a new reservoir they'll go back to old core and start doing things like porosity tests and perme permeability tests and they've got that data they've got that those samples they don't have to drill another hole okay so Any i think comments or queries hello Uh, I'll give it 30, 40 seconds here, and then I'll, uh, I'll close the meeting if that's okay. Is that, no. is that Zach again? I see your hand yes. is up. Yes. Yeah, yes. Go ahead. Um, okay, it's, it's me again. Um, on, the, on the issue of trying to convince, um, for example, management on, on how archiving um, is, is essential, how can we then, as, as young professionals, as young geologists in the industry, try to, to make sure that they see how crucial archiving is and how important it is for us to, to get enough time to, to collect data and, and, and actually come up with a model that will eventually help them in the mind? I don't have a good answer for that other than to chip away at it. Mm. Um, 
and continually refer to it. Roy, do you have any other ideas or Sophie? No, I think so. It is that it's really the, um, because, you know, I had a very good example was, was at Kinross. We ended up, as usual, in, in a pub having a discussion. And it was the um, chap, the manager who was in charge of maintaining the tires on the trucks. And he couldn't understand why they were wearing out. And he says, oh, if I just knew more about how hard the rock is and how, um, what, what damage it does to tires. And I says, well, we've got three football pitches of core. We can do some geotech test for you, really. And there was, as Camille said, everybody sits in their silos and don't go out enough to say, I've got a problem, who can help me? It doesn't matter where it comes from. So as you say, you have to just keep chipping away with management of keep telling them that what geologists do is the lifeblood of the mine. And if we get it wrong, then they're not going to have a mine. Mm. So we need to start advertising our importance a lot more than we do. Okay, th thank you so much. And also just one more thing, because you'd find, for example, with um, structure, right? So let's say they are on a flat end and they intersect a dike um, and then they're not sure if it is a dike or not, right? And then they send maybe um, one, of, one of the geos and then they confirm if it is or if it's not. They sort of see it there that, okay, these people are actually important. We're not, we're not trying to say we're more important than any other professions. We, we're just saying that they need to see... Um, the role that a, a geologist plays, especially in the, in, the, in the mine, when it comes to drilling, mapping, exploring, and, and expanding the life of the mine, finding more grounds. And, and I'll also add, um, there was a time where I was logging coal. Obviously, when you log, you expect to get drift at a certain depth, right? So when I couldn't see the reef at that depth, then I started having questions, what is going on here, right? and nobody could answer. And it turns out that the core was mixed. Who do we then blame, you know? Yeah. But, uh, no, I think it's, it's a good point. And I think it's, you know, I think one of the most important things is try not to do the blame. That's one of the, the cause. If you read up about knowledge management, that's one of the most important things. It's not a blame game is trying to do things better as a team. And so at least, and learn from it. And then you say, if it was mixed, how do we make sure we don't mix it the next time? Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, I've overstayed my welcome. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you again, Craig, for setting this up. This has been a, an excellent way to spend some time with, with some new colleagues. Thank you. Well, I must say it's not just me. It's uh, we have a bunch of people in the GSSA working on this, including Nolene, the VP of Meetings, Safiso, our president, Tanya Marshall has been involved in keeping us on the straight and narrow with uh, getting these things going properly. Uh, this will be recorded. It has been recorded, and we will release it uh, in an appropriate fashion at some stage in the next few days. But um, we're not. We still have to. We're not quite clear how we're going to do that yet, uh, but we'll put out a notice to people. Uh, apologies for the uh, technical delay, but it's bound to happen sooner or later. Uh, unfortunately, it happened today. And with that, I'll, I'll close the meeting, unless you have any closing comments, Roy or Safiso. Uh, no, thank you again from my side. And it's so it was actually so encouraging to listen to um, young geologists like Zach and Camille coming up with exactly the same issues that as old chappies have seen. So let's collectively, let's fix them. No comment from me. Thanks, Craig. Okay, with that, I'll end the meeting now. Thank you to everyone. Uh, we have a series of these things scheduled for the rest of the week, all at one o'clock. Uh, Safisa, do you remember what's tomorrow's lecture? I can't remember right offhand. Uh, just give me a second. Let me check the calendar. Tomorrow is Teresa. She'll be talking on ESG. Okay. Or like the SAMESC uh, in resource and reserve determination. 
Teresa okay, Steele Schober. It should be very interesting. So we'll, we'll see most of you back at one o'clock tomorrow. Good. Thank you, then. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, Roy.